incredibly complicated law that has led to remarkable, remarkable gains. Sandy can talk to you a lot more about the standards, but I'm going to give you sort of the impressionistic, the big picture of them. Deep commitment to classic literature, poetry, and drama. Right? So things like Huckleberry Finn, Charles Dickens, Sherlock Holmes, Edith Wharton, high quality novels, poetry, and drama. Why does this matter? It matters because the quality of the vocabulary found in those kinds of books are better than what you're going to find in, generally speaking, what they call informational text or nonfiction. You're going to have to uh, read between the lines. You're going to have to learn about tragedy and, 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 and comedy. And you're going to have to learn how to um, you know, appreciate friendship and, and compassion. There, when you read Huckleberry Finn, you learn about the relationship between Huck, a runaway orphan, and, uh, and, uh, and Jim, a runaway slave. You're learning about friendship. You're learning about the kinds of things that bind us together as human beings. Help generating the kinds of citizens that you want to share your community with. Right? This is the important feature of it. It's not just that, that they're old books or good books. They teach our children how to be human. They teach them about the things that bind us together as human beings. And it matters. It matters enormously. And it matters because they're academic performance. Because, as I mentioned, the vocabulary is better. And the kinds of reading tests that they're going to be expected to have are based on better quality vocabulary and more complicated texts. Okay? On the math side, Massachusetts emulated uh, the East Asian countries and some of the best practices from California, which had very high mathematics standards. And what 15,000 pieces of research demonstrate is that you have to have access to Algebra 1 in the 8th grade. If you have access to Algebra 1 in the 8th grade, it gives you enough room in a high school so if your kids want to study the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that you can have pre-calculus, calculus, and, and, and trigonometry if that's the route you want to go. But you've got to start early enough. And we did that in Massachusetts. Okay? So very high quality academic standards on the English side, very high quality academic standards on the math side. So what are the results? We've been 20 years into this project and bipartisan support. We've spent billion, you know, $100 billion or more. What are the results? Well, while the rest of the country has still been on this nation at risk, stagnation and decline, Massachusetts has basically gone from a middle of a pack state to number one in the country in internationally competitive. There's a test called the NAEP test. It's the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It's the nation's report card. It's administered every couple of years. Every state in the union takes it. It's been around for 30 or 40 years. No state in the history of that test has been number one in every grade tested and every category tested. In 2005, guess what state did it? Massachusetts. Right? It's an enormous accomplishment. Taxpayers, teachers, principals, school committee members, superintendents. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable, remarkable accomplishment. And we did that again in 2007. 2009, 2011, 2013. So no state had ever done it once. We've done it five times in a row. I, I say that it's the equivalent of winning five World Series in a row and winning it in four straight games each time. <coughs> Mind-boggling. But that Nation at Risk report in 1983 was very, very clear. To compete in the 21st century, you've got to be able to compete with Hong Kong and Singapore and South Korea and Japan and Germany these really, really high-performing countries. So in 2007, Massachusetts tested as its own individual country on a test called the TIMS test. It's the gold standard of international math and science testing. And it, what, it, what the, that 2008 uh, TIMS testing illustrated is, is that our eighth graders were tied for number one in the world in science. And we were among the top three or four in the world in mathematics in both fourth and eighth grade. Again, Remarkable accomplishment. And then they did the same thing in 2013 on that same test. Now, if having this success on the nation's report card, the NAEP test, is like winning five World Series. The success on the TIMS is like winning Olympic gold medals. Okay? Remarkable. So, that's the good news. The bad news is that starting in about 2006, 2007, the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers and what they call the 
Beltway Bandits or the DC Blob is what they call these players, these sort of trade groups that have been kicking around Washington, DC for decades. They haven't improved student achievement anywhere. They can't cite one place where they've actually improved student achievement in the last 20, 25 years. They decided that we need to fix the problems for the country. We've got to have national standards. So they began to develop Common Core. And they are private trade organizations. They're out of the, pur the purview of public scrutiny. So if you want to do a Freedom of Information Act search about the people that own and have the copyright on the Common Core standards, guess what? They don't have to comply with your Freedom of Information Act search. They don't have to tell you anything about how much money they spent developing the standards, who developed the standards, what was the process for the selection of those people. They don't have to tell you anything because they own those standards. Okay? Then what happened is, is that there was the stimulus package that came down in 2009. There was no national debate about whether we're going to have national standards there were, uh, or tests or curriculum. There were no bills fired in co filed in Congress. There were no hearings or discussion. Baked into the stimulus package in 2009, they put a program called Race to the Top. And the Race to the Top gave the U.S. Department of Education and the Secretary of Education discretion over $4.3 billion. So he set up a contest called Race to the Top. Well, here in Massachusetts, we already knew that the Race to the Top was really the race to become Massachusetts. And everybody else knew that. The advocates of Common Core knew this too. They always knew they had to have Massachusetts. They had to have Massachusetts, because if Massachusetts adopt, and they're internationally competitive, and we're best in the country, what can like Mississippi, or Alabama, or Arkansas, or New Mexico, the real low-performing states, they can't say no, right? So what happened is that the Governor's Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers worked with the U.S. Department of Education to bake in this Race to the Top contest, states having to sign on to the Common Core and to national testing as a condition for getting portion of the $4.3 billion. Well, in the summer of 2010, Massachusetts adopted the Common Core. When everyone else was at the beach and barbecuing and having a good time, that's when the Patrick administration, that's when the State Board of Education thought it was a good idea to make a decision about changing tracks from the proven standards that had led to all these historic successes to the unproven Common Core. So Pioneer Institute, where I work, is an independent think tank, right? Uh, I mean, even our critics will say, we're not, we don't carry water for anybody, okay? <coughs> we thought that given Massachusetts had the most to lose, that we ought to take a look at the quality of these standards. So we got Dr. Stotsky, we got Jim Milgram, who's a professor of mathematics at Stanford University. He's an internationally respected mathematician. He also worked on the very high quality math standards in California. We coupled them together with a guy named Zev Werman, who's a Silicon Valley engineer, also had been very active in math standards development in California. And we had these three re researchers look at the academic quality of Common Core against high standard states like Massachusetts and Indiana and Texas and Minnesota and California. And they did these exhaustive 40, 50 page crosswalks going back and forth comparing the standards in the Common Core drafts against the standards that we have in those high performance states. And guess what they found? They found that in fact this was not going to be a race to the top. For high standard states like Massachusetts, this was going to be a race to the middle. They, they uh, pointed out that Common Core in English language arts or in reading was going to be ignoring the evidence from Massachusetts and going to cut classic literature and poetry and drama. So the reason why our kids are number one in the world, uh, number one in the country in reading and every grade tested over five years is the commitment to classic literature, poetry, and drama. Common Core cuts that. So no Huckleberry Finn, no Sherlock Holmes, no Charles Dickens, no higher quality <coughs> classic literature, right? They cut that, right? On the math side, they also ignored the evidence, not only from Massachusetts, not only from California, but all the East Asian countries, and decided to push forward access to Algebra 1, not in the eighth grade, the way everyone knows is the way to go, but they're going to have it in late ninth or early 10th grade. Then they're going to use an experimental form of geometry that has never been successful in any place it's been tried. And it's going to really top out at what Professor Milgram calls Algebra 2 light. So if your child is interested in the STEM field, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics, Common Core is really a path to nowhere. Right? But don't, you know, don't take my word for it or Jim Milgram's word for it. I'm going to read you 
some lines from the people that were the uh, advocates of this, and uh, and the people that that uh, that helped develop them. So this is uh, this is Jason Zimba. He was the the chief architect of the math standards for the Common Core. This is what he said, and you can look this up. Sandy Stotsky debated him on the Board of Ed in 2010. So if you just Google Jason Zimba with a Z, Mass Board of Ed, you'll see a video pop up. It's a couple of minutes, and it's even more telling than this quote. But this is what, this is what uh, Mr. Zimba said. Here's a, Jason Zimba, lead architect and writer for the Common Core Math Standards, said that they prepare students for a quote for the colleges most kids go to, but not for the colleges most parents aspire to and added that the standards are, quote, not for selective colleges. So if you want to send your kid to a really good school, these aren't the standards for you. Bill McCallum, mathematician from the University of Arizona, he too was one of the co-authors of the Common Core Math Standards. This is what he told uh, uh, a press set in California in 2010. Quote, the overall standards would not be too high, certainly not in comparison to other nations, including East Asia, where the math standards uh, education or math education excels. End quote. One, one more. Well, I think that, that will suffice. So it, it's uh, it's not just the people that are opposed to it. Those are the people that wrote them in their own words and publicly have acknowledged that these are not very good. They're not very good standards. Okay. So. The, so the first piece of research that we looked at was the academic quality. Because that's where conversations about standards begin and end. What's the quality? What's the quality of what my kid's going to be taught? Right? And what we're saying is they're not very good. Right? The next piece of research that we looked at was the legality. Because I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the fact is, is that there are laws that prohibit, prohibit the federal government from funding or directing or validating or supporting national standards testing and curriculum. So we enlisted uh, the formal general counsel and deputy general counsel at the U.S. Department of Edu Education under the second Bush administration, uh, two highest ranking lawyers in the federal government over the, uh, in the past administration. And what they mapped out in lawyerly detail is that there are three federal laws that prevent the feds from doing what they've done under both race to the top and funding the park. And those laws are the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, signed by Lyndon Johnson, there's the General Education Provisions Act of 1970, signed by Richard Nixon, and the uh, enabling legislation that set up the U.S. Department of Education itself, which was signed in, uh, in 1979 by Jimmy Carter. So two of the three presidents that signed these federal laws were Democrats. This is not a partisan issue, folks. It's not a partisan issue. It's a legal issue. Right? And it's very, very clear the feds are not supposed to be funding or directing or validating national standards of testing and curriculum. This is precisely what they've done. But it's not just our opinion. George Will is one of the best syndicated, best respected syndicated columnists over the last 30 years in this country. He's done several columns on it, one of them citing our research, essentially saying that the U.S. Department of Education is brushing aside federal laws that prohibit them from doing what it is that they want to do. The next piece of research we took a look at is the cost. Because even though 40 some odd states have adopted, the reality of it is, is that only a handful of those states have done any kind of cost projection, what's going to cost the, the, the states and localities to implement it, because they're going to pay for it. The $250 million that we got to raise to the top is over four years. That money's gone. If you do the math, it's basically uh, over four years, we got a million students. It's basically about 33 cents per kid per day. That barely covers milk. It's not going to cover the cost of this. Right? And the long and the short of it is, is that we, uh, our projection is that it's going to cost the Commonwealth about $350 uh, million to implement what are demonstrably lower quality standards. It's going to be $16 billion nationally. So there, there's a variety of other issues around it, which we can get in during the, during the Q&A, uh, but there's an enormous amount of pushback going on across the country. The fact is that more parents and legislators and people in the general public find out about it, the less happy they are about it. And the, the solutions to this, on the short term here in Massachusetts, is to make your voice known to, to Governor Baker and the Secretary of Education and the Department of Education that you don't want us to do PARC. Because all of this stuff gets locked in if we go from the MCAS test 
and go over the park. It will all get locked in and it will not be able to get undone. That's the most important issue. There's a variety of hearings.